church family. My name is Dr. Sarah Harper, and I'm the director of traditional worship here at Collierville United Methodist Church, and I want to welcome you to worship with us today. I want to draw your attention to the pew pads on the back side of the pew in front of you. I invite you to fill out the connect card inside and let us know of your presence here today and if there's anything we can be praying for this week. Um, also, today is the kickoff of our 90-day giving challenge. You'll hear a little bit more about that in the service, but you can place your challenge pledge card in the offering plate or you may bring it forward during communion. I would also like to remind you all that there is no children's church today, so the children will not be dismissed during the service. Each week we begin our time together by reciting our vision statement, which can be found in your bulletin or on the screens. Let's say it together. Reaching out to transform lives by extending God's love to all. Our opening scripture this morning is from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be now let's begin our time of worship together. Please join me in our call to worship. Come together, church. Await the coming of the Comforter. The promise rests within us. Our hearts anticipate the Spirit. Would you be empowered to serve and witness this day? We are here to follow Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. From Jerusalem to Judea, then on to Samaria and the ends of the earth. We are sent forth to share good news in the name of Christ. Amen. Please stand as you are able and let us sing together, Battle Belong. Thank you. 
So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the God's children said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we celebrate communion today, it's important to note that this table is open to all. You do not have to be a member of this or any other church. We believe that you can meet Christ here at this table, and so we would not turn anyone away. Will you join me on page 12 of your hymnal, or the words for our invitation will be on the screen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin and one another. God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray in silence.
Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Good morning. My name is Ashley Morgan, and I am honored to be your liturgist this morning. Y'all, I'm sorry, my kids were my baby. That was mine screaming, so um, <laughs> just trying to troubleshoot that real quick. <laughs> All right. Ooh, it's a morning. As we go to God in time of prayer this morning, I would encourage you to the re review the list of those who we are aware of that are in hospice, rehab, or the hospital. You will see the names in the, your bulletin or in the downloadable worship guide. Please include all these persons in your daily prayer life this week. Also realize that we all have other joys and concerns on our hearts this morning. Let us take a few moments to pray alone in silence before I lead us in a congregational prayer. We will close by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. You can find the text of that prayer on the screens or in page 895 of the hymnal. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today as a congregation united in prayer, seeking your strength and guidance in the midst of the storms that we are facing. We know that life is filled with challenges and difficulties, but we also know that you are with us every step of the way. Lord, we ask for your peace to fill our hearts and minds as we navigate through the uncertainties and struggles that surround us. Help us to lean on each other for support and encouragement, drawing strength from our unity as a community of believers. We pray for those who are directly affected by the storms in their lives, whether they be physical, emotional, or spiritual. May your presence be felt in their darkest moments, bringing them comfort and hope. We lift up our leaders, both in our church and in our world, asking for wisdom and discernment as they make decisions that impact our communities. Help them to seek your will above all else, leading with compassion and integrity. Lord, we also pray for unity among us as we face these storms together. Help us to set aside our differences and come together in love and understanding supporting one another in word and deed. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers and grant us the strength to weather any storm that comes our way. May we emerge stronger and more united, shining your light in the darkness for all to see. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship together, we will be singing what may be a new hymn to you all. So you'll find the words on your screen, on the screen. So I invite you to stand as you are able and join as we sing together. Holy Spirit.
Good morning, church family. Good morning. It's a great looking group out there. I tell you, all looking great today. Um, I'm Kerry Pappas. I'm uh, the finance chair for the church, and uh, I'm going to share a short message with you guys today. Um, share a little bit about, you know, sort of where we're headed uh, from a financial perspective, and then, of course, try to um, encourage us to do what we can to help the church as we go forward. First of all, I started this role about a year ago, um, and it's been a, an eye-opening experience. I haven't been, <laughs> been involved in the, the business of the church before, so it's definitely been something that's been an eye-opening experience for me. Um, I'm probably the last person that the church probably would have signed up for to go do this. I'm probably more comfortable back there in the back row than I am up here in the front of this, the, the church, but um, God you know, works in mysterious ways, and, and here I am. So uh, one of the skills I will say that God gave me is I'm a pretty good turnaround person, so um, we've done a lot of work to try to ensure that the church is in a great position going forward uh, and to sort of shore up uh, our lines so that we can do, do great things. So. I've got a little kneeler prayer in my uh, bedroom that I've been on my knees a lot more <laughs> since I got this job. And uh, so uh, when I was praying to God, God whispered something to me the other day, and I'm going to pick on Julie Smith because she's not here today. But uh, <laughs> when, when I was praying to God, he said, yeah, I might have got a little nudge from Julie Smith to put you in this role. So I just wanted you to know that. So <laughs> Maybe a push, I don't know. So, But um, it's good. I've learned a lot. Um, I have to tell you that, uh, you know, serving in this role has been uh, both eye-opening and rewarding, and it's a pleasure to serve with an amazing group of finance committee members and, and really loyal little church members who are doing some, some great things uh, for our church. So, um, but we're here today talking about the, the um, basically we have a cash flow issue, uh, to be perfectly frank. Uh, we're running negative numbers right now, um, and we've got to do, do something to shore up those, those numbers. It's primarily in our general fund um, because, you know, we have a lot of funds that are put away for endowment and, and for specific causes, but we can't use those to pay day-to-day -day business expenses, you know, uh, things like, you know, our salaries and the, the utilities and things like that. So what we did, and I wanted to assure you that, that the committee has taken really, really deep dives into this program to make sure that we're doing everything we could first. My, my view of, of any time kind of you're trying to turn around something is to look inside first, so it's an inside outlook. So we looked at what we were doing, and I want to share some things that we've, we've done and the actions that have been taken. We've re reduced the budget by around half a million dollars uh, from last year to this year. Um, we've implemented build, building rental plans that are generating a little bit over $100,000 a year in revenue for the church that we weren't getting last year. Um, we've implemented bank sweep accounts and, and uh, corporate cards to get money back uh, and to earn interest on the money that we do have in the bank that's generating about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year. So we're sitting on about $125,000 to $130,000 in, in uh, revenue that we didn't have before. I think the great thing about what we've done so far is we have grown the, the church membership, and I'm super excited about that. And so, but the next lead-in really is this 90-day challenge. Summer is typically our shortest um, giving months. Uh, yes, I'm, believe me, I totally understand people are on vacation. You know, you got trips planned. There's extra expenses. The kids are home and all sorts of the, that sort of thing that happens, on, happens during that period of time. But um, it's definitely, it definitely impacts the church when we, when we have those sort of things. So, so it's, I think it's important for you guys to know sort of what some of our headwinds are. Um, obviously, in the post-pandemic uh, period, um, church attendance across the globe has dropped, um, us included in that. Obviously, we had the, the situation we had last year with the vote, so that obviously brought our church attendance down dramatically. We're all individually and as a church are dealing with 20% inflation over the last three years. Uh, everything's more expensive, and that includes everything the church is doing to try to uh, do to serve our community in, in the best way possible. Um, we've had a bunch of backlog facility uh, issues that needed to be addressed as well. Um, and so, you know, when you look at some of these things that have happened, MLG and W my rate hike was probably another three to four thousand dollars a month. So it's been a it's been a difficult period of time. But we have worked on it. We have done some some really good things. I'm confident about what we've got going forward. That said, I want to be 100 percent forthright in in what we're looking at here. I, I do believe the future of our church is at risk um, if we don't find ways to monetize further. Um, Basically, what I'm saying here is, and I think what the real risk here is for me is something I wrote, which is what I feel like really is at stake here is this is the most important faith-based community who, who really has responded to the challenging times and has become a complete family. Um, I see so much camaraderie and so much um, kindness and volunteerism but from Team Jesus and from uh, the staff who, who are all basically overburdened at this point, you know, trying to do their jobs, and they're all given more. that you know They're serving each other. 
Um, we're helping those that are in need. Uh, you know, I'm part of the gleaning mission, and, uh, and Tommy talked about it last week, but it's super rewarding to walk into these places and deliver. We delivered eight, on Wednesday this week 1,800 pounds of uh, food to uh, uh, downtown uh, UMC Church, and it's super rewarding. Those folks are really thankful. They gave us a really nice um, um, thank you card and, uh, and appreciate us. But th this church as a whole has pulled themselves together, you know, and we, we are really... I think doing some great things for the community, and I want to see us to continue, continue to thrive um, as, a, as a unit. So what I'm asking for is, is uh, to please consider the 90-day challenge. Um, I know everybody's situation is different, and the last thing I want to do is stand up here and ask for money. Um, I feel bad every time the pastors have to do it, and uh, so I sort of volunteered to do this one today because I feel like, you know, you needed to hear it from at least somebody that, that uh, you know, uh, seeing the numbers as they are, and, and we've tried to be as, as frank and honest about it as we possibly can. But, you know, we need about five to $7,000 more a week, which sounds like a lot. Um, we have about maybe 325 to 400 people that attend church services on a weekly basis. Um, if you sort of divide that up into say there's 200, you know, families or individuals that give, which is probably a little low, it comes down to about $30 more per week per family. And I know some folks can give more and will, and some folks can give less, and some can't give anything. All I ask for you, anybody to do is just please pray on it. Um, you know, ask God for some guidance around, around this and try to help us to secure our financial uh, footing for the church. Um, we've got lots of big decisions coming up. We've got big facilities. We've got a couple of them. We've got land. Uh, we've, got, we've got decisions to be made. Right now, we're just trying to shore up the day-to-day -day operating expense so that we don't have to, like, you know, chew our nails when we're trying to pay the, the salaries um, twice a month. So, um, I would ask that from my, from my standpoint, just in, in humbleness, if a heartfelt request to just consider that and uh, to help us to keep growing this church as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our God, you guide us as a loving shepherd. In your presence, our spirits are renewed. In your wisdom, we discover peace. In fellowship together, we find ways to share your good news with others. As we enjoy your blessings, help us to give from our abundance with glad and generous hearts. We dedicate these tithes and offerings in the name of Jesus, the good shepherd who laid down his life for his flock. Amen.
Hi, I'm Parker McNeil, and I'll be reading the scripture today. Today's reading comes from the Acts of Apostles, chapter 26, 1 through 3, and 9 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began to defend himself. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, because you are especially familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg of you to listen to me patiently. Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and that is what I did in Jerusalem. With authority received from the chief priests, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being condemned to death. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blasphemy, and since I was so furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, when at midday along the road, Your Excellency, I saw a light from the heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me and my companions. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. I asked, Who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm Dr. Deborah Sutterth, senior pastor, and I'm so thankful to be in worship with you today. And for those of you joining us on live stream, we are honored that you have joined us today as well. And before I jump into Acts chapter 26, I want to share just how thankful I am to Carrie Pappas and to our other leadership council members. They include Julie Smith, lay leader, Dave Herlong, Administrative Board Chair, John Salmons, Treasurer, Bill Daniels, Staff Parish Relations Committee, and Matt Morgan, Trustees Chair. Along with our amazing staff, these incredible volunteers are helping us every week continue to chart a course for strength and sustainability. Will you help me thank them? Let us pray. Loving God, fill our hearts, fill our spirits, and fill our lives with your holy presence and power in this place. In this hour, engage us with your comforting arms. Embrace our spirits to know you in a new way this day. Equip us for your ministry, building us up to be your faithful church, the body of Christ. Empower us, O Lord, to deeply become your disciples and uniquely live as the hands and feet of Jesus, so that we may be a blessing to those whom we meet this week. Amen. Well, this story of Paul and King Agrippa, to me, is fascinating. Actually, if we had read some of the previous chapter, we would also know that the governor of Judea, Festus, and King Agrippa's sister, Bernice, were also present. Today, I would like to share with you a few biblical nuggets. And both those of you at home and all of you here in this place, you can write them down so you'll remember them and have them with you. These nuggets will help you to see why I think this is a fascinating story. Now, this portion of Paul's arrest and trial story, it actually began five chapters ago in Acts chapter 21. You see, a Jewish mob started throwing false accusations against Paul outside of the temple one day. And then they started beating him and trying to kill him. Well, at this point, a Roman commander steps in to save Paul, and he's taking Paul to the safety of the barracks 
to protect him and arrest him both. But before Paul went inside, he asked that commander if he might speak to the people, you know, to that group that was trying to kill him and was trying to beat him up. So I want you to hold that nugget in your mind for a minute, the one about Paul asking to speak to this group. We will come back to it. Now, the scripture states that this first arrest in Acts 21 and our scripture for today, Acts 26, there were at least four different people that Paul was dragged in front of to figure out exactly what to do with him. Each time, Paul was given a chance to tell parts of his story. So nugget number two, multiple times, Paul had to retell his story. Now, this is where we find ourselves today. Paul is in Caesarea with the governor of Judea, Festus. Paul's been on trial and is awaiting to be heard by the Roman emperor, no less, and that will be his last chance to be set free. While he was awaiting to be transferred to Rome, the Palestinian ruler, King Agrippa, and his sister Bernice, well, they arrive in Caesarea. So Festus decides to ask them to, for their help, please listen to Paul's case with me. You see, Festus was quite surprised by the so-called charges brought against Paul. In Acts 25, 19, Festus describes the ordeal to King Agrippa, and he says this, those Jewish authorities had certain points of disagreement with Paul about their very own religion and about a certain Jesus who they said had died, but Paul says is alive. That sure sounds to me like Festus just kind of thought this was one big family squabble. He, as a legal Roman authority, could not see how anything Paul said went against the Jewish religion. So nugget number three, this ambiguity is why Paul kept being tossed from official to official. No one knew quite what to do with Paul. Now, not only did you get a few nuggets of biblical history here, but I tell you all of this to make a point. It's the Jewish leaders who keep demanding that Paul be tried in front of all these different officials. They were going to great lengths to actively gag Paul and hopefully kill him. Yet, our Paul seems to relish and the opportunity to get to tell and retell his story. Paul seems to find great joy in sharing not just his story, but his faith story. He took the opportunity to share the good news of his encounter with Jesus, and he did that with the dignitaries in Jerusalem and Palestine and Caesarea and eventually Rome. Paul, I believe, knew exactly what he was doing. Paul is creating an intentional stir to get the Jesus message out there more widely. Paul earlier asked to be seen by the emperor, and that wasn't to go plead his case. It was to tell his story. Paul is turning this dark and horrible situation of arrest into a prime opportunity to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, how does that saying go? Bad publicity is still publicity, just free? Paul is making the most of this bad situation and trying, turning this bad publicity into skyrocketing ratings and free PR for Jesus. Notice how, how Paul, when he meets with King Agrippa, he butters him up. Did you hear in verse 2, Paul says, well, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I get to make my defense because you are especially familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Now, that does not sound like to me that he is pleading his case. He sounds like someone who speaks with conviction and courage and the knowledge that God is with him. God is with him in imprisonment, and even unto death. Therefore, that type of faith can and does speak with confidence and gusto. You see, Paul's not 
defending his beliefs. He's not even on the defensive. Paul is giving a bold testimony to his faith. So who really has called this hearing today? Is it King Agrippa and Festus, or is it Paul and God? Now let's shift for a minute to light. Here are a few more biblical nuggets. Think with me for a minute about the reoccurring theme in Paul's life of light. First, he's blinded by the light on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And later in chapter 13, both Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying that the Lord had commanded them to be lights to the Gentiles and to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And third from today, chapter 26, 18, God wants Paul to open the eyes of the Gentiles so that they may turn from darkness to light. And so just exactly how did the early Christian church grow and expand from Jerusalem to Rome and from Damascus to Ethiopia? How did the Holy Spirit move in each of these little towns across all of the regions? Paul would tell us two answers. One, by being a light to the nations through the sharing of his faith over and over and over and over again. And number two, he taught all of those who would listen how to share their faith. And so when he found himself with an opportunity to share, you know what I have figured out? He overshared. Does everyone at home and here in person remember earlier in the sermon, I had you hold on to a nugget. The one where Paul asked the commander to keep, may I please speak to these people, to those very same people who tried to beat him up and kill him. The commander, he let him do it. And do you know what Paul shared back there in Acts 21? He shared the exact same story that he shared for King Agrippa today using the same three-point formula. He found that even in these dire situations, he could be a light for Christ. Therefore, here's the new nugget that I found this time when I reread this chapter in Acts. Paul overshares. He overshares his defense and describes in detail exactly all the horrible ways that he persecuted Christians in his life before his encounter with Jesus. And then he tells of his dramatic encounter on the road to Damascus. And third, he shares exactly how his life has been changed because of Jesus. He did this time and time again to audience after audience throughout the whole book of Acts. That's one of the major ways that the early Christian church grew and expanded. Now looking at it this way, what would your faith story look like what was your life before you truly encountered Jesus or decided to more faithfully follow him? Second, what was your encounter? It could have been a small aha moment or it might have been a dramatic experience. And third, how is your life different or changed now because of Jesus? Our faith stories don't even have to be more than a minute or two. Now, in the spirit of oversharing, I have an example of a different way we might find ourselves able to share the Jesus in our hearts. So imagine you have friend A and friend B. Friend A asks friend B the standard question, so what'd you do this weekend? And friend B could say, oh, Saturday I did some yard work, and then on Sunday the wife and I went to church and out to lunch, period. End of story. Or friend B could choose the overshare option, and it might sound like this. Oh, Saturday I did yard work, and then Sunday the family and I went to church. Since my car wreck 10 years ago, it's been extra meaningful for us to worship together and to be thankful for all that God has done for us. And then we went out to lunch, I watched the baseball game, and then I grilled out for the family. Now friend B 
did not have to do a deep dive. And note that he added the other things he normally does on Saturday and Sunday to make it feel more normal and not preachy. Now, friend A might not bite that day or ask questions of friend B's church and faith. But I bet you a thousand bucks that his friend will remember it and will know exactly who to go to if and when he has a car wreck experience. Friend B was a light in his friend's life that day. Your story is worth sharing. Your experiences can help others. Your life can be a light to someone else. And then there's something else I want to share. I have one more thing. Something that I feel will impact every last one of us here today and all of those online. Each and every time that Paul tells his faith story to yet another official and another crowd, you can hear the conviction in his words that he knows in his little toes that God is with him. Yes, through thick and thin, imprisonment and harsh treatment, he knew that God was with him. Today, I also want each and every one of us to hear that God is with you. Today, this might be the very message you need to hear the most. God is with you. Paul's story reminds us of this foundational belief. So whether we need someone else to be a light for us today, or we're ready to try to be a light for a friend, we can remember that God is with us. That through thick and thin, and illness and depression, grief and physical pain, job loss and brokenness in our families, God is with us. And Jesus comforts us. The Holy Spirit guides us and gives us courage and strength. Friends, no one should have to walk this spiritual journey alone. We are all here together. Amen and amen. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you and certainly a joy to invite you all to the table of our Lord. Invite you now to follow along with the Liturgy of the Great Thanksgiving on the screens or also in page 13 of your hymnals. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. 
When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. It's time now to share in the bread and cup. Pastor Deb will give us some direction on that and also tell us about our communion offering for today. If you would like to leave uh, funds for the resource redistribution ministry, better known as Gleaning, we will receive those at the communion offering. And thank you for your generosity. Our ushers will help us come to the chancel rail, and we will place the elements in front of you on the rail, making it easier for you to then take. And if you would like a gluten-free option, please let us know. We have them in our baskets. We ask that those who are helping with all the music come forward first, and then others can come as well.
Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may now go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Friends, I could have started praying over Andrew, but that song is just too beautiful, um, so I chose not to. As we sing our closing song, Firm Foundation, that God is with us, if you've always wanted to join some place wonderful, we invite you to join this great congregation today, either by transfer of membership or we'll start a great conversation about baptism. For we know that there's no place near this place. I did this earlier. There's no place like this place near this place. Help me out, help me out. This must be the place, the place for you to belong. Will you now stand to sing? Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad than I put my faith in Jesus, because He
Amen. Friends, it is the first Sunday of the month, so our Stephen ministers will be out in the narthex to your right. If you would like to talk to them, they are an incredibly trained group of lay persons that will walk with you through difficult times. If that would be helpful, please find one of them or call me and I'll help connect you. If you feel like you're being called to be a Stephen minister, talk to them as well. They will welcome you gladly. Thank you for being with us online and in person today. It's been a joy for all of us to be present together. And guests among us, I, we have a gift for you, so please find me or Joey or Jonathan in the back, and we will be able to give you that. So friends, I invite you back next Sunday, and I invite you to invite someone on your block or at your work or from your school so that they might know Jesus' love and that God is with them, just like you. Will you receive this benediction? We have come and sung praise to you, God. Now let us go and sing God's praise. We have come and heard the word of God. Now let us go and share God's word. And we have come and been with the people of God. Let us go and be God's people. Go in peace. Amen. As we leave this holy place, bless us with.
Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. 